All right, so um, today's session, which is data preprocessing and uh, it's typed what? Forgotten here. Uh, so, this is wrong actually. It's supposed to be preprocessing and transformation. Um, the outline is as follows. We are going to first of all start by uh, just getting an appreciation of the different types of data that we are going to work with. And then we'll look at um, um, some generic steps that are normally taken when you undergo a process of cleaning up the data. And it's unfortunate that Francis was giving his talk way before we had a discussion about this. Uh, I think what would have been interesting was to find out from him what sort of uh, pre-processing tasks he performed on the image data, right? Um, but I just want to mention that part two is mostly going to focus on text, uh, text or content, right? And then if we have enough time, we'll look at uh, the data transformation. So once you clean up this data, how exactly do you get to format it in a manner that these learning algorithms will be able to understand? Because it turns out that uh, the initial representation of the information or the data you're working with um, cannot be fed directly into these learning algorithms. So you need to transform it in a format that will be easily recognized by the learning algorithm itself. Okay, so part one. <coughs> so a reminder here that uh, during our discussion of these uh, five core processes, uh, what we're doing essentially is just uh, still looking at data preparation, right? And, and if you still remember our discussion of data preparation, we mentioned that some of the key steps that you would actually go through involve um, the data selection process so where you get to decide what sort of input data you're going to, to, to take into account. So to latch on to Francis' presentation, he made a decision that they were going to go out into the field and get uh, images of the four worms, and also they decided to download images from the internet as well. So they, they went through the data selection process that way. <coughs> And then we also um, discussed the data cleaning or pre-processing process where we mentioned that uh, it's usually the case that this data might be messed up, so you might have outliers in the, in the data itself, so you want to make sure that all those things are isolated. If you have things like uh, uh, duplicates, for instance, you want to make sure that you exclude the duplicates. Um, if you have null values, you want to make the decision as to how you're going to handle the null values. Are you going to exclude records with null values or are you going to replace the null values with some um, derived uh, value, for instance? It could be an average, for instance, um, or some default textual, textual value. Um, and then we also mentioned that uh, the data preparation part also involves uh, the transformation of the data itself, because remember that the, the end goal of here is to come up with a data set that you're going to feed into the learning algorithms, right? So transformation is also part of the data preparation process. And then also, owing to the fact that you would normally um, make use of data sets coming from different sources, um, you go through a process of merging the different data sources. Uh, I guess the closest example here is uh, when I was running us through the um, ICT 11, 11, 10 um, problem sets that we're exploiting at the moment, right? Remember we had information that was coming through from uh, a questionnaire information coming through from the student grades, information coming through from SIS, right, demographic details and things of that nature. Um, and then, so obviously it makes sense that um, at the end of the data preparation process, you merge all those different data sources together. Um, and then obviously the data formatting, you want to make sure that um, if there's need for you to rescale the data, you do that, right? Because it might not always be the case that um, You'd, you'd use the same range of values um, from the original input data set, right? It's fairly common to rescale the values between uh, val values between zero and one, for instance. There's something similar to a log scale when you're plotting graphs. Um, and then obviously, one of the other things you want to do is to be able to describe uh, comprehensively the data set that you're working with. Right, so in terms of like the outputs, if you remember again, the, the, the outcome for all these different sub-processes here is uh, for your data selection, you want to uh, come up with an inclusion and exclusion criteria, right? It's not always the case that you would incorporate data coming in from all the different data sources, so you want to come up with um, logical reasons for why you want to include a particular data set and ex exclude a particular data set as well. Um, and then the outcome of the data cleaning and preprocessing step, we mentioned that um, is ideally just improved quality of the data that's going to be fed into the model itself. It's one of the reasons why you go through this uh, cleaning and preprocessing step. 
uh, the transformation stage would in part uh, result in you coming up with derived fields, right? Um, and of course, transform the values um, for some of the existing attributes. You get an appreciation of this particular step once we 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 start going through how you you convert uh, categor categorical values like male or female, right? How do you go about transforming it in a form that a computer is able to understand? It has to be a number, right? You can't use F or M. It has to be a number, right? So you transform it. Um, and then the, the data integration and merging part results in um, just one string or one comprehensive data set that you feed to the model itself. And really what you, you end up doing once you implement the model is using this merged data set, you start playing around with different combinations of the different variables, right, features, as, as we'll learn very soon. Um, and then finally, the formatting will just transform the data into a format that the machine is going to be able to expect. So just a quick rundown of uh, what we discussed when we were looking at this particular phase. Nothing new here, I hope. Um, all right, so but overall, um, again, just to reiterate, the final outcome of this particular process, um, remember it's related to the modeling process or phase, is the actual input uh, data set that's going to be fed into the model, or to the model, um, and then a description of the data set itself. Um, so limitations associated with the data set and the format um, as pertains to the different attributes associated with the data. All right, so um, again, just to remind us that um, I, I mentioned that you know when we're working with when we're working with uh, input data, it comes in various shapes and forms, right? It could be uh, texture data, for instance, um, is this case. And so what we're going to be going through really as we're discussing the data preparation part is to try and understand how we uh, transition from the initial stage, which is the raw input data, um, to the stage where we get to clean it up. Uh, notice here we're cleaning it up and stemming it, removing stop words. Um, and then all the way up to the process where we get to transform it into a form that the uh, learning algorithm is able to understand. Right? So ultimately the goal when you're working with text, for instance, is you want to convert this textual representation into um, a format such as this. And, and really, even though when you're working with text, I guess one of the um, most common ways is to come up with a TF IDF representation of the data, but there are other ways of doing this. Uh, like, I don't know if you discussed this with uh, Dr. Piri, but uh, things like weight to vec, for instance, um, would be equivalent of what we're doing here with the TF IDF um, representation of the data. Right. And what this does, uh, again, we have uh, a discussion about this, but what this does really is, is it looks at, um, um, because remember the data set you're working with, if you're working with documents, will be composed of uh, uh, abstracts associated with the different observations of the data sets, right? So the goal is to come up with uh, one vector representation that contains all, or at least in theory, all the strings, all the strings, the unique strings that are found in the different documents that make up your data set or your corpus, right? So if your vocabulary has, let's say, uh, a unique set of words that totals 500, then this vector will have 500 columns, right? Um, and so this is showing you to say uh, the word uh, Zambia studies or something, not Zambia studies, but Zambia use, the combination of the word Zambia use is found one time in this particular abstract or a combination of abstract and title. Right. Uh, and something else I wanted to mention whilst still on this um, slide here is the fact that uh, it really doesn't matter that, uh, so this is a result of stemming, it doesn't matter that you have thesis instead of thesis, right? Because the computer doesn't care. Human being might care, but the computer doesn't, doesn't care that this is shortened to thesis and Zambia is, uh, uh, or studies is shortened to study, for instance, right? Just stemming it so that you, you isolate um, words that are derived from the same root word. Okay, uh, again, just to kind of um, uh, highlight the fact that you typically be working with different types of data sets, right? Um, and really one, what you soon realize is that um, these different uh, data sources that you'd be working with are associated with different types of attributes, right? Um, 
All right, so fundamentally, when you're working with, uh, with, with, with these uh, observations or instances of the data, one thing you realize is that um, these different instances will be associated with different attributes, right? So, um, and by attributes, we are, we are really referring to the characteristics associated with the different values associated with the data. So if we were to go to this particular example, um, the value associated with the quizzes would be a separate attribute. The student ID would be a separate attribute. Um, you could view, I guess, a textual representation of, of this particular abstract as being um, an attribute in its own right. But, and I know this is revision uh, from our, our stats discussion, hopefully somewhere at fourth year or third year or something, depending on how long your program was. Um, what we do know that, irrespective of the type of data you're working with, fundamentally, um, the attributes associated with this data can be categorized into two main parts, right? So it's either the uh, attributes is categorical in nature or it's continuous, right? Um, and really when you're referring to categorical attributes, um, there are three main forms, the examples, don't worry. Um, so there are what you call nominal attributes. So these would be um, uh, discrete values that represent two or more categories. Rich, poor, uh, rich, poor, and I guess comfortable something, I don't know, making things up, so two or more, right? Uh, good, bad, neutral, something, right? Um, and then um, you also have ordinal attributes. Um, th these are more or less like similar to nominal attributes with the one key difference, the fact that with ordinal attributes, the order is somewhat important, right? So uh, if you look at male and female, it doesn't matter if you start with male or female, right? The order doesn't matter. But if you're looking at uh, things like uh, grades, or if you're looking at Likert scale like data, then you know that um, the order uh, matters because uh, strongly agree is obviously better than strongly disagree. Right. And then you also have um, dichotomous data, which is just uh, similar to uh, nominal attributes uh, with one key difference. You'd be dealing with just two values here. So gender, for instance, male or female, right. assuming there's no neutral here. Um, and then you, um, you also have continuous attributes, um, which, which um, if, you, if you are to compare continuous attributes to categorical attributes, you, you are more or less uh, referring to qualitative data here, or descriptive information when you're dealing with categorical values, right? But when you're talking about or making reference to continuous attributes, what you're dealing with uh, qualitative data, quantitative data, rather. so numbers for the most part. Um, and really when it comes to the types that you'd be dealing with, uh, it's either inter interval attributes uh, or racial attributes. Um, and the difference between the two really is such that uh, when you're dealing with uh, interval attributes, what you're looking at is just a continuous range of values. Um, racial attributes are more or less similar to interval attributes with one key difference. Uh, a zero has no significance for racial attributes, I don't know if this makes sense. So I guess if you look up literature online, they'll cite examples like uh, if you're looking at somebody's weight, you, you, if you say zero kg, it has no meaning, right? But one kg has a meaning. Right. Um, okay, so again, just to kind of uh, give us some, um, some, some random examples of these different types of attributes. Uh, so if you look at interval attributes, I guess, uh, using our example from the CRISP-DM uh, walkthrough we had here, we will be looking at grades here, the range of values that fall within a D, a C, a C plus, right? Um, and some other key traits are that you can, you can literally perform some sort of mathematical operations on the range of values. And really when I'm, I'm referring to the Ds and C pluses, I'm actually referring to the actual ranges, not the, the textual representations of the Ds, right? If we look at the Ds themselves, as they appear here, would be referring to uh, ordinal attributes. I don't know if this makes sense. But, but if you are referring to the ranges that fall within the 
D's and the C pluses, and we're saying the interval attributes or something. Okay, um, and then in terms of the racial attributes here, I'm, I'm loosely using this C example here. Uh, I know that in, in certain circles, maybe a negative score is there. It exists, right, if it's a penalty or something, but I'm assuming that uh, we, are, we are looking at a case where you're saying zero means nothing at all, right? So it has to be greater than zero or something. So it's an example of the racial attribute from our data set. Let me just say, when I look at the, the student ID, yes. the like, uh, values are hashed values? Yeah, this, so these, these are just hashed values. It's trying to mask, uh, oh. deliberately trying to mask people's identities here, because this is uh, actually, it's not uh, manufactured data, it's actual data itself. I don't know if they'd be happy, but to see their names being <laughs> flushed around. <laughs> I don't know why, but you know. <clears throat> and I know what you're thinking, you can easily reverse engineer or something. But no, these are hashed from, guess what, <laughs> these, are, these are hashed from here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can't actually reverse it. It's not the hash of the student ID, so don't waste your time. It's the hash of these, um, you know, doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, all right, so an example of, uh, and I know again, uh, these days this is becoming a, a hot issue, I guess, in Zambia, I don't know. Some people would say I, uh, I'm non-binary or whatever, but we're assuming, we're looking at a case where it's just male or female here, right? So, so sorry? Yeah, but, but we're looking at, uh, in our case, this data set only has two values, so <laughs> it's an example of a dichotomous attribute, right? Um, so listen, I mean, it's a, I'm walking us through this to just, uh, it's like revision, but it turns out that the way that you transform these different um, values is different. So the way that you transform a categorical value into a representation that your learning algorithm will be able to understand is different from the way that you transform an ordinal value. It gets even more interesting when you're working with things like dates, even though you might think that a date is uh, continuous, right? technically speaking, but it turns out that the way that you transform those things is different as well, right? So just something to keep at the back of our minds, right? Uh, the fact that depending on the type of attribute that you're working with, the transformation process will be different. Uh, so I know the revision for the people in the room here, one hot encoding and all those funny things. Okay, so uh, examples of nominal attributes would be um, the minors section here, the mi minors column. Uh, our st these particular students have a major and a minor, right? So we have, uh, I think an in any given year, we have an average of about five to six uh, minors. That's more than two categories, right? Which is why we're saying it's nominal. Um, but another key trait is that the order doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you say, I'm going to start with civic education or languages, uh, unless if you want to bring in the argument of the alphabet or something, which is still really pointless, right? <coughs> okay. Um, and, and again, uh, if you were to compare it with some of these other attributes, notice that the only mathematical operation that you'd be performing on something like this is an equality test. You, maybe you'd be interested in testing if uh, the civic education value is equal to languages or something, I don't know. Right? Nothing else, you can't add these things, right? Um, you multiply them or something. I don't know if this is making sense. Um, and then an example of uh, ordinal values again still from our data set. Um, we normally ask, um, um, we normally have like, uh, questions that involve uh, uh, the students uh, filling out some, um, some Leckett scale, right? Uh, so this is an example here, uh, us trying to find out the sort of experience people have using computers, right? Um, we know that there's some significance when we find a person who has five years experience when compared to someone who has one year experience using computers. So the order matters, the ordinal attribute. Uh, I always run out of examples besides besides uh, things you find in a questionnaire. I don't know if people have ideas on where else you can find ordinal values here. Examples of ordinal values other than things you find in a questionnaire. You, I don't know if, uh, would you say, 
income, if you look at, uh, well, I guess, I was going to say the Zambia Demographic House and survey, but incomes, right, uh, would you say those are ordinal values? So different levels of income values, right, if you come up with income brackets. But, but perhaps also something else you, you can, we could cite is uh, uh, people's ages. Usually, and again, this is in questionnaires, usually they'll ask you what, how old are you, they will not they will not ask you to state the actual age, it's, it's a range, you choose, say I'm between 25 and 30 or something, right, 30 to 35, 30 to 40, right. Um, so again, these are ordinary attributes, the way that you uh, convert them into a, a representation that the machine is able to understand is different from, from this and this, right, so something to remember here as well. Hey, I, I, uh, I have a question here. Well, what sort of uh, attributes would we be working with if we are looking at text data? Remember, the, the, when we are referring to attributes of data, we're just saying characteristics of that information that helps help us describe the information or the, the observations associated with that data set, right? So, what? Uh, <coughs> What type of attribute would be associated to this type of data? Would this be ordinal or something, or or would this be categorical? Say <laughs> so not categorical, right? But uh, I don't know. Um, I, I one way of thinking about this is uh, asking yourself simple questions like, does the order matter or something? Um, and also, I guess, uh, think of this from the point of view of um, the eventual representation of this information from the perspective of the learning algorithm, right? So, um, even though the default things you'd be working with will order these things in alphabetical order, but it, it wouldn't really matter if, if this column was the first one, right? Two or more, uh, we could easily view these as categories, no? It's certainly not continuous data here, right? So we could view these as categories, two or more categories, right? Um, two categories, two or more categories, where order is not important, right? Something to think about here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, another question here, I mean, when we are, oh, we're already given it. Well, I was going to ask, say, what about uh, image data, like what Francis was, was discussing. I know we haven't really got into a stage where we're working with data, but I, I think there was a sneak preview last week where I showed us exactly how these learning algorithms get to, or what sort of um, input they expect from images, right? You unroll this into the respective pixels, right? So this would be like a distinct attributes as well. No, already mentioned text here. Uh, we'll soon see exactly how we, we get to take advantage of models such as the bag of words we need to come up with a uh, representation that we want to feed to the model itself. I, I don't know if uh, that was a good enough intro to uh, data attributes, unless if people want uh, another exercise of examples of data attributes. Maybe you have questions of uh, certain types of data, perhaps at the bank or something that you work with that you, you, you can't really um, classify as being, or you're a bit confused as to which type of category it falls under, no? No, okay.